for the time we can spend together here tonight, Lord, studying your word. As we look into Ephesians chapter 4, I pray that you will speak to each one of us as to uh, how you want us to conduct our lives as believers in Christ. So, Lord, I know there are some here that it's their very first Bible study, and so I just pray it'll be a blessing for them, Lord, that they will be encouraged and blessed. And uh, might we all, Lord, be encouraged just to walk closer to you. Uh, Father, we thank you for your protection and your blessing here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Okay, we normally do have the front door open. Uh, Tony's always here early. He always unlocks the front door at around 6.30. So it's always, uh, and so if the side door's locked, then uh, just come around the front. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 11. We want to start with verse 11. We're going to talk about what God does for the church. Now, the church isn't the building. The church is the body of Christ. That's us. We are the church. So the word church in the Greek is ekklesia. And that word translated means the called out ones. So God has called us out of the world into his kingdom, into his body. So we are the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones, okay? So the Bible says here in verse 11, and God himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Now these are the gifts that God gives to the church. And so God gives to us these gifts so that we can learn more about him And then we can be challenged to walk with him in a closer way. Verse 12. Also for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So pastors, teachers, apostles, and prophets, and evangelists are to build up the body of Christ. Uh, The Bible says we preach the word to reprove, uh, rebuke, and instruct. So walking in love means that we sometimes need correction. Amen? Uh, and anybody that's a parent in here knows there's most of the time very loving towards our children, very quiet with them, but when they need correction, we have to do that. And the Bible says if we don't, then we hate our children. So uh, all of those gifts are used to build up the church so that the church, that's us, that's you and I, Jack, that's you and I, Brother Steve, and, and Sandra, that's us. We're required to do the work of the ministry. Uh, I think America has gotten it so crooked for so long that we think the pastor, we hire the pastor to do all the work and everybody else just comes and feeds and that's, that's not biblical whatsoever. Uh, the pastor is only for teaching and encouraging the saints to go out and do the work of the ministry. Verse uh, 13, Ephesians 4 and 13 says, until we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we should no longer be like children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but rather speaking the truth in love that we would grow up into all things unto him who is the head Christ. And I think we're just going to get that far tonight, verse 11 through verse 15. There's a lot of information to share. Did everyone get notes for the Bible study tonight? Anybody didn't get notes? Okay, uh, could we get uh, Brother Steve some notes? Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you, my brother. All right. So let's start with verse 11. God gave the church some apostles. Not everyone's an apostle. Some prophets. Not everyone's a prophet. I went to a church one time, and they were saying, okay, you prophesy to him, you prophesy to him, you prophesy. They called it popcorn prophecy. And I said, where's that in the Bible? You know, uh, it was crazy. 
And, and so not everyone is called to be a prophet. Not everyone's called to be an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher. Called means you have a specific calling in your life that God has given you, and it's exhibited by the fact that he gives you the talents and the gifts to do that, to do that job. Um, tell you a quick story. Uh, in that church where everybody prophesied, uh, my friend was told, oh, you're going to do a great work in Texas. So, and I took him aside and I said, brother, I think you're an encourager. I, I like the fact that you encourage the saints. But I'm telling you, from what I can see and the way you conduct yourself, you're not a prophet. And the church told him, oh, yes, you are. Yes, you're a prophet. And we're going to give you some money and send you down to Corpus Christi, Texas. And there's going to be a great revival. I warned him, I prayed, I begged him not to go, and he went anyway. So he dragged his wife and two little kids down there, and they had two more when they were there. And their revival, revival consisted of an old lady across the street that they had to go and get to bring to their house for their revival. And that was it. And finally they ended up, unfortunately, having to move in with her parents, so his mother-in-law, and they've been there ever since, now 20 years living in another state with a mother-in-law, no job, no nothing. So we have to be very, very careful about our callings in the Lord. And that's what pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets and apostles do, is to try to bring order into the body of Christ. And everybody has a different gift. We all have gifts, but they're all differing according to the measure of the fullness of stature of Christ. So, I want us to look at some scriptures here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians. And I have seen a lot of disorder in places that I've been. It wasn't organized. And God is God of order. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14.33, God is not the author of confusion. He's the author of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, Let everything be done decently and in order. And that doesn't mean you time God out, you know, at 6.02 we're going to do this, and at 6.04 we're going to do this. And No, no, we've got to leave room for the Holy Spirit to move. But it needs to be done decently and in order. I was just recently met with a pastor that said while he was preaching, some guy busted in the front door and started yelling and screaming, calling him a false prophet, and coming up the aisle, and it was handled quite quickly. Uh, one of the, their security team picked the guy up, threw him over his shoulder, and took him right back out the front door. You know, God isn't the author of those things. And I've heard people who claim to be prophets say, well, I just couldn't help it, I had to prophesy. That's not true either. The Bible says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So we can control ourselves. And there's people that just want to jump up and look at me, you know, and, and they, they, just, they just want all the attention. And so we're, go we're going to read a little bit about that. 1 Corinthians 12, starting with verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and your members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, then prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healing and helps and administrations and variety of tongues. Is everyone an apostle? Is everyone a prophet? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues or do all interpret? So earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I'll show you a more excellent way. And then the Apostle Paul goes into chapter 13 talking about love. Now, love is highly misunderstood. Highly misunderstood. People think that when they get goosebumps, uh, that's the Holy Spirit. Not necessarily. No. Love is an action. Love isn't always sweet and kind and, 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 uh, and soft. Love can be a warning. Love can be a rebuke. Uh, if you love someone and you see them driving towards a cliff and you tackle them before they get there, that's love. 
That's love, warning someone from destruction. That is love. But people look at that, no, that's control, that's hate, no. No, love has many different facets, many different facets. So in Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul uh, addresses this in Acts chapter 20, starting with verse 26, and he says this, Therefore I testify to you this day, that I am innocent of the blood of all men. So Paul had been here in the church of Ephesus encouraging the elders to lead the body of Christ in serving him. And first thing he says is, I'm free from the blood of all men. Now why would Paul say that? Well, he goes on to explain. Because I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So what is the whole counsel of God? Well, essentially heaven and hell. Okay? That is the whole counsel of God. God wants us to be in heaven with him. He wants to save our souls. He wants us to walk with him. And, if, uh, and also to warn people of hell. And there are uh, very, actually very popular preachers on TV that just talk about God just, you know, wants to bless you. He just wants to make you rich. He just wants to, everything's good. You know, good rattlesnakes, good black widows, good everything. And, and that's not the whole counsel of God. Uh, I did not come to Jesus until somebody told me I was lost. I didn't know I was lost. I mean, I was glad that Jesus died on the cross for me, but take it or leave it. But when someone said, Greg, if you don't receive the gift of eternal life, you're lost. And if you die without receiving Christ as your Savior... You'll be lost forever. You'll be without God. You'll be in a place called hell, or, uh, which is the lake of fire. And it's burning with fire and brimstone. It was never intended for us human beings. It was intended for the devil and his rebellious angels. That's who it was intended for. You can find that in Matthew 25 and verse 41. But the fact of it is, is, is if we reject God's, God's free gift, our life isn't guaranteed. We don't know when God is going to call each one of us home. And, you know, it's a sobering thought, but go to, go to a cemetery sometime. Look at the gravestones. Look at the ages of the people who have died. You can find them all the way from one-year-old all the way up past 100. So I'm sure those who were teenagers in the cemetery, uh, they were planning on living up until their, you know, their old age. But they're... Their life ended soon, so we need to be cognizant of the fact that God gives us these gifts to help us, to encourage us, and to warn us of the wrath to come. So let's take a look at Romans 12, Romans chapter 12, and what God has to say to us about our conduct. Right after the book of Acts, the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 4, the Bible says we have many members in one body, but all the members don't have the same function. So let's just look at our own body. My fingers don't do what my toes do. My arm doesn't do what my leg does. My head doesn't do what my shoulders do. Every, I have all these body parts. I'm, I'm one body, but every part has a different function. It's the same right here. The body of Christ, we all have a different function. Here's, unfortunately, sometimes what happens in church is people get their eyes on someone else and they say, well, I want to do what that guy's doing. And, and the fact of it is God's given us all different gifts. You know, at one point I... I I would have loved to have learned how to play guitar. I had a friend in the Navy that could play guitar like nobody's business, and I wanted to do that. And so I took lessons. I think I lasted two days, brother. And my fingers were killing me. And I just decided, that's not for me. That's not my gift. Uh, it, was, it was too much work and too much pain. For those who have that gift, it's not too much work and too much pain. So we have to discern, God, what have you called me to do? And I've had people come to me and say, I wish I knew what my gift was. And, and I tell them, what do you like to do? Some people like to cook. Then that's your gift. Cook and bless others and visit them and tell them about Jesus. 
Uh, some people like to pray, then that's your gift. Uh, some people like to encourage others or exhort others, that's your gift. Uh, but just ask God, what have you gifted me with? What, what is it you want me to do in the body of Christ? Amen? Um, I know this lady that attended a very big church here in town. Not the biggest one, but almost the biggest one. And one day she was sitting in the, in the uh, auditorium, and she, wa- she was watching people come through the front door, and nobody was saying hello to them. So she just thought, you know, I think I'm going to get up and just go talk to people as they're coming into church. And she loved doing that. And so after doing it like a month or two, someone asked her, oh, did the pastor appoint you to do this? And she said, no, uh, the Lord appointed me to do this. And they said, well, you're doing a great job. Keep doing it. You know, so we have to see where we fit in, in like that. Our, uh, our uh, audio technician back there, Sopita, uh, when she first came to this church, uh, she didn't know what her gift was. But we, we had a need in the audio department for someone to run the cameras and do all the things. And she said, I, you know, I have an interest in that kind of stuff. I'll learn how to do it. And she's been doing it now seven, seven plus years. So she found out what her gift is. And each one of us need to search that out. So in Romans 12, verse 5, the scripture goes on to say, So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts that differ according to the grace that's given to us, let us use our gifts. If it's prophecy, then let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. If it's ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches, let him use it in teaching. He who exhorts, in exhortation. He who gives, let him give liberally. He who leads, let him do it with diligence. He who shows mercy, let him do it with cheerfulness. But let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to that which is good. And then in verse 12, we're back in Ephesians 4. So God gives the church gifts. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. I really believe that God has gifted me in evangelism. My my heartbeat is about bringing people to Jesus Christ. Uh, But I, I guess I'm a stationary evangelist. A lot of evangelists travel all over, and God has always had me stationary evangelizing. Remember Avila Beach, Barbara? Every Sunday, strangers would come into the church and get saved, would take them down to the beach and baptize. Almost every Sunday we had someone saved, or some several someone saved, and then walked them down to the beach and baptized them. It was amazing, you know, how, how God, when he calls you, he qualifies you. So... Ask him, get in some quiet time with the Lord. What's my gift? I think one of the greatest gifts in the church is intercessory prayer. We have several of those in here who their heartbeat is to pray. Pray for the church, pray for the leaders, pray for the congregation, pray for the needs of the community. All they do is pray. And that's, that's a gift from the Lord. So, God gave, uh, verse 12, God gave the church ministers to perfect or mature the saints, people who are born again, for the work of the ministry, and for building up the body of Christ. So again, this is, this is all about strengthening the body of Christ. I have met people who were very young in the Lord, but they were studied, they were prayed up, and, they, and God used them very powerfully. And I've met people that have been saved 40 years and they're still sitting in the pew, you know, sitting on their blessed assurance, not doing a blessed thing for Jesus. And I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying, God doesn't want us to be babies forever. He wants us to grow. He wants us to mature. He wants us to move on. Uh, Why? Because other people need to be saved. Uh, Okay, 1 Corinthians 12. So we want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to look at verse 4. 
Now there are diversities of gifts, but it's by the same Spirit. So God gives differences in gifts, but it's the Holy Spirit that does that. There are differences of ministries, but it's the same Lord. Okay, so not every church is the same. There are some churches that center in on one thing. Other churches center in on another thing. We should all center in on the gospel of Jesus Christ, for sure. But there are other gifts. Some, some churches are really pointed towards feeding the poor. And that's a, that's a good gift. Praise God for that. Other churches are, are, are reaching out into the community and helping people who are on drugs and alcohol, etc. So there's all kinds of different ministries. Okay? It's the same Lord, verse, verse 6. There are differences of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. Now the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one to profit everyone. So the gifts operate in the church, and I'm really blessed to pastor this body of believers because I see gifts in operation. I see people ministering one to another and encouraging one another, giving one another rides and taking each other out to lunch or coffee. That's a a great thing for a church to do, to get to know each other and minister one to another. Uh, There's another gift that isn't mentioned here, but it's the gift of hospitality. And we have several people in our fellowship that love to be hospitable to others. Okay, It's not not for everybody, but it it works in the church. So Colossians now, the book of Colossians. So we were in Ephesians 4, and we're going to go back to that. But if you turn past uh, Ephesians through Philippians to Colossians. Is this coming through okay? Everybody okay? Thank you, brother. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Now you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, now has he reconciled. In other words, at one point we were lost. We all had to be born again. Amen? We all had to get saved. So at one point we were enemies. We were enemies of the cross. We were alienated. We were away from God. And so the scripture goes on to say, in the body of his flesh... He has reconciled us in the body of his flesh, Jesus has, through, through death, so that he can present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul the Apostle, became a minister." Uh, He goes on to say here in verse 24, I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body. So in other words, when there's a calling in your life, sometimes we have to give up our own plans. You know, uh, there, there are people who are called to visit those in rest homes and in hospitals. And a lot of times you have plans to do one thing and God calls you to do something else. This week I got two calls for funerals. Uh, None of them come to this church, uh, but there are people who contacted me and said, would you be, we can't find a pastor, would you be able to do a funeral? And uh, I have to move my schedule around in order to do that. So that's what I'm trying to get to. It's a a life of sacrifice. It, It isn't something that's, easily done. We have to get the power of the Lord to help us to do those things. Verse 26. uh, Paul says he's become a minister to be a steward of the mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. And what is that mystery? Christ in us, the hope of glory. The mystery is how do we get to heaven through what Jesus did on the cross. That's the mystery. A lot of people don't know about that. A lot of people are lost. They're in cults. They're taught that you do this and you do this and you do these three things and these five things and bow six times and move these beads and do all this other stuff. No. It's only through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a mystery. It's, It's a truth that hasn't yet been revealed to everyone. And God wishes for that to to be revealed. 
So God willed to make known what are the riches of glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we preach him, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom so that we can present every man perfect or mature in Christ Jesus. Paul says, to this end I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. The Apostle Paul traveled all over uh, Asia, all over Europe, just bringing people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and bringing them up and appointing teachers and, and pastors to churches so that the church could be built. And yet we hear this today in our modern society. Church isn't important. You need to go to church. You know, as long as you prayed the prayer, you got your ticket to heaven, you're good to go. Well, I'll take you back to this scripture in Colossians where he says in verse 23, if you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Satan loves to lie to people. He loves to lie to people and tell them, oh, no, no, you've, you've got your fire insurance. You're good. You can do anything you want, go anywhere you want, act any way you want. You don't need to read the Bible. You don't need to go to church. You don't need to be in fellowship with anyone else. He lies to people. And, and what, is, what does that end up in? That ends up in them moving away from the gospel. You know, when I was a young boy on the sheep ranch, here's one of the things I learned. Every time a lamb strayed away from the, from the flock... The coyotes got him every single time. And if you've been saved for a long time, you've met people who started out good. They started out strong. They, they walked with the Lord and then they strayed away. And after they strayed away, they lost their faith. They lost their hope. They walked away from the Lord. So it makes me wonder, were they truly born again in the first place? And it makes me wonder, God, are you big enough to bring them back if they're really yours? And I know God is big enough. But the fact of it is, we need to stay. We're important to each other. We have to have each other. We have to encourage each other. We have to walk with each other. And one of the big reasons is, is because the enemy is constantly tempting us to move away from the fire of the gospel, move away from, from the excitement of being a Christian. Okay, Hebrews chapter 10 addresses that as well. And so... Verse 11 in Ephesians 4, God gave the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. In verse 12, we looked at the church ministers are there to, to mature saints so we can do the work of the ministry. Okay, That's us. God calls us to do the work of the ministry. Not a person, but the whole church to do the work of the ministry. And then we're looking at uh, here in uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. So I want to get there in a minute. Right before the book of James, Hebrews 10, starting with verse 19, the Bible says, therefore, brethren, so now he's talking to Christians, brethren, people who are saved, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, which is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Uh, I am shocked at the percentages that I'm hearing from Barnes and others who take polls of Christian churches. Just a few years ago, it was, 39, it was believed that 39% of the population attended some sort of church service uh, back uh, in the 1980s, about 39%. In the 50s, it was almost everybody. You couldn't find a store open. But we're down to less than 10% of the people in the country now feel that church is important at all. And it's not about the building. It's about the Lord, and it's about us as the church. It's about us. You know, the Bible says this, a house that's divided against itself cannot stand. So if we're not in unity, when the trouble comes, we're going to fall. And that's all there is to it. 
These, this is why the church, uh, the underground church in Africa, in India, in China is so strong. Because they are persecuted, so they come together in unity of the faith. And they pray and strengthen and encourage one another all the time. Their pastors are being dragged off to prison. Uh, they're being beaten uh, for information, etc. But the church grows stronger because they have to be in unity together. And uh, I'm not going to say who said this, but uh, someone said this to me during the revival. Uh, in America, we become lazy lambs. And I thought about that, and I thought, that reminds me back at the sheep ranch. When we would take the sheep up to the plateau, where there was, you know, water and trees and shade, they would all just lay down and enjoy, you know. And it's not until persecution comes that the church really gets strong. So if you think about it, we have heated buildings, soft seats to sit on. Uh, nobody's coming in here with... Uh, you know, with the police arresting us for meeting in, for the name of Jesus, etc. And I think sometimes we just get really complacent about all that. And we don't really take it seriously. So uh, we are to come together in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God into maturity. I want to finish Hebrews and then we're going to go on to our next, next part here. Hebrews chapter... Uh, 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Have you ever met anybody that wavered? One minute they're on fire for God, the next minute they're out to lunch somewhere. Uh, God says, don't waver. He says in James, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Unstable. So he says, draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, because the one who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know one of the enemy's biggest tricks? In my life. Just keep me so busy I don't have time to do anything. That's one of his biggest tricks. You know, I'm, I'm set out to go, okay, I need to go visit this person, and I need to call this one and encourage him. And all of a sudden I'll get 15 texts and all these other things to distract me. How about you? How about every time you decide, you know, I think I really need to go and, and hear a good word from the Lord, and the enemy throws 15 things at you that causes you to miss it. And, and that's, that's his trick. And so the only way to overcome that is to make a decision, this is what I'm going to do. And no matter what happens, this is what I'm going to do. And because it's never wrong to do right. Amen? And uh, I've had people tell me, you know, uh, regarding our Thursday night Bible study, isn't it about time to close it down now? It's been 30 years. Until God tells me to close it down, that's when it'll be closed down. And God himself will close it down. But is, and there, and don't you think for a minute that there are times that I'm tired? I don't want to be there. I, maybe something happened that day that really disturbed me and, and now i got to go and teach the Bible and I've just made a decision. I don't care what you throw at me, devil. I will be there no matter what. I don't care if I feel good, bad, or indifferent. I'm going to be there because I trust that it's Jesus that moves through us and Jesus works through us to do things. And so when we allow the enemy to give us excuses why we can't go, there's something more important and sometimes I hear those excuses and it's like, ah, I think the enemy tricked you on that one. So we need to take self-inventory, amen? We really do. And that's what Ephesians chapter 4 is all about. Really, each one of us, not looking at someone else, but each one of us looking at ourselves and taking inventory. How am I doing, Lord? How am I doing? Am I a faithful child? Am I a faithful servant? 
Or do I just, if there's nothing else going on, that I can go and be with the other brethren? I'm telling you, a time is coming in this country where persecution, real bad persecution, is going to start. And Jesus said this, if they can't survive in the green tree, what are they going to do in the dry tree? In other words, what he was saying is now that the weather's nice and the trees are green and they're having a hard time making it here, what are they going to do when winter comes and the trees are dry and the climate's dry and it's cold? Uh, what are we going to do spiritually when it's cold? What are we going to do? Uh, so, so God wants us to stay hot for him and, and there's a way to do that. It's not just saying what we need to do. How do we do it? Well, I would say the first thing to do is pray and speak with your father and get to know him. Really get to know him. Not know about him, but know him. And the best way I've found to get to know him is in the word of God. Just looking, see, what is his personality like? What, is he, what does he react to? What does he respond to? What is his actions in the word of God? And that helps me to get to know him better. And the other way is to do just what we're doing here tonight. Just what we're doing here tonight. Just meeting together, encouraging one another, hearing God's word, and growing in the faith. That's, that's the way to stay hot for the Lord. So in verse 13, we as the church are to come together in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. That's uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 13. Paul says we have to be in unity. And we have to be in unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God into maturity. So back into the book of Colossians, which is two books to the right of where we are right now in Ephesians. If you just go to the book of Colossians, chapter 2, Paul writes this, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh so that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I remember when I first got saved, I knew nothing about the Bible, nothing about it at all. And this, this uh, discipler, a uh, friend of mine who brought me to the church, said, I want you to read the book of John. I just want you to get into the book of John and read the book of John over and over and over and over and over. So for a whole year, I just read the book of John. And people would say, well, you know, uh, do you know where James is? I said, yeah, when the pastor preaches, he has us turn to James. But I'm studying in the book of John. Why? So I could get to know Jesus. So I could get to know what moves him, who he really is, what he thinks, how he, re how he acts, how he moves among his disciples, the love that he shows, the miracles that he did. Man, if you've never just studied the book of John, study the book of John. It just reveals Jesus in so many different ways. That's how we draw close to him, it getting to know him, not know about him, know him. So in 1 Corinthians 14... 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 20. Paul tells the Corinthians, now the Corinthian church was very gifted. They had just about all the gifts in operation. But they were so out to lunch and the way they were operating, it was, it was more about immaturity than it was maturity. And, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 20, Paul says, Brethren, don't be children in your understanding, but in malice or in hatred, then be like babies. But in your understanding, be mature. Grow, grow in, in, the, in the grace of God. So why would he say that to the Corinthians? So turn with me to 1 Corinthians 3. We're in 14 now. If you just turn to your left, you'll get into chapter 3. And here's what he's saying. And I'm going to read it the way it reads in Scripture, and then I'm going to put it down into modern context, okay? I, brethren, Paul writes, this is the third chapter 
in the first letter he wrote them. And he says, I, brethren, can't speak to you like spiritual people, but rather like fleshly people or carnal people, like babies in Christ. Because I have fed you with milk and not with solid food. Up until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able. You are still carnal, where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not yet carnal and behaving like mere men? Because one says, well, I am of Paul. I love that when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to my house. They always want to know what church I go to. And I tell them, uh, well, first of all, I don't go to a church because we are the church. And secondly, uh, I'm a believer in Christ. Because I know if you tell them I'm a Baptist, then they already got you in a little box. Or I'm a Pentecostal, they got you in this box. Or I'm a Presbyterian, they got you in that box. Or I'm a Catholic, and they got you in that box. So I just say I'm a believer in Christ. How about you? And they say, well, what do you mean by that? And I say, well, what I mean by that is that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. That's what I mean by that. And then we get into their scriptures. I won't even bring my Bible. I just get into theirs and show them, prove to them how Christ is the Lord. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is God Almighty. That's who he is. And then they say, but you worship three gods. And I tell them, no. My Bible tells me in Deuteronomy that God is one. And all throughout the scripture, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. But those three are one. And uh, they, they just get frustrated because you could prove to them in their own scripture that they're believing falsehoods, but they've been so indoctrinated that if you leave our assembly, then you're a reprobate and, and you have no eternal life whatsoever. So it's important for us to grow. Paul says, look, you guys are in, you're carnal because some of you say, I'm Paul. I'm of Paul. Some say I'm of Apollos. And so in modern context, well, we're Baptists, so we can't fellowship with you. Oh, we're, we're from Foursquare. You, you don't believe like we believe. Oh, we're Assembly of God. You, you don't believe like we believe. And I thank God for this church because we believe in the Bible. And we're not separated out into we're Baptists and this and that and the other. No, we're believers in Christ. And we already understand that there are different ways to worship. Some people like to just hold their hands and bow their heads. Other people like to raise their, hand, their hands. Other people uh, like to clap. Whatever worship mode that you need to do, you're free to do so. And you don't find that in a lot of places. Usually if you go in, you can pick up the mode of what's going on in that place right, rather quickly by just observing. But we want to be free in the Holy Spirit. Amen? We, we want to follow the Lord. In the Bible, we want to stay in the Word of God. Amen. So, he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 3, Who then is Paul? Who then is Apollos? But rather ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. So Paul says, look, I planted, Apollos watered, but it's God who gives the increase. So then, it's neither he who plants anything, or nor he who waters but it's God who gives the increase. So he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Because we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. So then he goes on to say, according to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. So Paul's reminding them, I came to your city and showed you Christ, and many of you received him as Lord and Savior. So I laid the foundation of Jesus Christ, but it's up to you to build on it. Okay, so if you've ever been by a construction site, and I know you have if you live in Santa Maria, you see these concrete things with little steel markers out of them and maybe pieces of wood sticking up. Somebody's building on that foundation. They've laid the foundation, but somebody else is building on that foundation. And I mean, quite literally, the cement guys came in and laid the foundation, and they're gone. They're done with their work. 
And now it's up to the carpenters and the construction people and everybody else to do their job. And then the plumbers come in. And then the roofers come in. And, and all the different workers that, that build a house. God says we're the same way. Let's go on and read that. He says, there, uh, verse uh, 10, According to the grace which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, but another is building on it. So let each one of you take heed or be careful how you build on it. Because there's no other foundation that anyone can lay other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold or silver or precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, he's talking about good works and not good works. Uh, what are not good works? They could look good, but if it's done with the wrong motive... They're not good works. So what's the motive in which we operate in the body of Christ? What's our motive? You know, why are we here? What, what are we, are we drawn closer to the Lord? Or is it so we can count nickels and noses? Amen? So he goes on to say, each one's work will become clear because the day, and that's the day of Christ, that's the day we're raptured and we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that day is going to declare what our works are. Because it will be revealed by fire. That was a little scary when I first studied it. And what it means is, the Lord, in Revelation 19, his eyes are like a flame of fire. In other words, Christ sees all the way into our heart. He sees all the way into our motives, all the way into our actions. So it's not how much work we do. It's why did we do it? And you'll see that right here. The fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. In other words, what are the motives? Why did we do what we did? And then in verse 16, he says, If anyone's work he is built on endures or stays, he's going to get a reward. And I preached on that, I don't know, three or four months ago about the crowns that we get as believers that God gives us uh, for the things that he's done through us on this earth. And of course, we know and understand from scripture, we, we toss those crowns to him in the kingdom of heaven. He deserves those crowns. He gives them to us, but we give them to him. I, I learned that lesson from a little baby. Babies don't own anything don't have a wallet, they don't have a bank account, uh, they, they can't even talk. But the one thing babies will do is give you what they have. So they're eating that stuff that you would need if you had to, and all of a sudden, they reach out their spoon and give it to you. It's the only thing they have. That's all they have. But when they offer you that, you're supposed to take it. Otherwise, you're rejecting their gift. And it's the same thing with the Lord. The Lord gives us what we really don't deserve. He gives us what we don't deserve. He gives us rewards. And we give those rewards right back to him. We toss those crowns at his feet. So he goes on to say, if anyone's work is burned. In other words, the work wasn't of the right motive or the right kind. And so... It was lost. Uh, there's, I believe there's some people that get the reward here on this earth. Look what I did. Look what I built. Look how big this is. Look how awesome this is. That's their reward. And when they get to heaven, there won't be a reward because they receive their reward here. You know, the praise of men and all accolades and all that other stuff. So the scripture says if anyone's work is burned, he's going to suffer loss. Loss of what? Loss of salvation? Well, first of all, you won't be at the judgment seat of Christ if you're not saved. So you'll be there. But then it just depends, how did I conduct my life? Did my works abide where I got a reward? Or did my works get burned because they were not the works that God wanted done? So, well, obviously, when he says he'll suffer loss, he means suffer the loss of rewards, not suffer the loss of his salvation. And here's why. Read the rest of the verse. If anyone's work, verse 15, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, 
yet so is through fire. In other words, through the fiery eyes of Christ, he sees our heart that we truly believe in him and we truly trust what he did on the cross. So we have our salvation. So you can't get salvation and rewards mixed up. Salvation belongs to Christ. Salvation is what Jesus did on the cross. We can't earn that. We don't deserve that. All we can do is receive that. Okay, that's the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the rewards are up to us. Remember what Paul said? I've laid the foundation. Now it's up to you to build on it. Okay, we're going to move on to um, verse 14 in, Colossians, uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. The apostle tells the Ephesians, don't be like children who were tossed to and fro with every kind of teaching and by tricksters who want to deceive the flock. Are there people out there like that? <laughs> there, are, there are people out there that are out there for all kinds of motives. I want to get rich. I want a bigger airplane. I want a bigger this. I want a, more of this. Uh, there's all kinds of tricksters out there. So we who are saved know by our spirit whether we can bear witness with someone else's spirit. And if something seems off, then check your spirit. Check the Bible. Make sure that you're following the right thing. I had a friend who was constantly confused. All the time, constantly confused. Can, can we lose our salvation? Can we not lose our salvation? Uh, if, if my works get burned, does that mean I go to hell? Uh, all, all kinds of confusion. And I said, brother, did you... Did you believe what I told you when I said quit listening to 58 different teachers and preachers? Why don't you, your pastor is a good pastor. Why don't you just go to that church and learn what God has you to learn there? And, and at whatever point, God will move you forward to the next place where you can get further teaching on something else. But because you're jumping around to this guy, that guy, this one, and that one, you're also getting doctrine from false prophets, false teachers, and these guys that have wrong motives. So no wonder you're confused. So I pointed him back to the Bible. Go to the Bible. Go to a church where they preach the Bible. And, and we know that God's word is true. So if we're following God's word, we're not, we're not going to be tricked. Okay, so let's take a look at that. The apostle says, don't be like children who were tossed to and fro with every kind of teaching and by tricksters who want to deceive the flock. Let's take a look at Isaiah 28. The book of Isaiah, uh, right after the book of Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Isaiah chapter 28. Verses 9 and 10. God's asking these questions. Whom will he teach knowledge? To whom will he make to understand the message? Those who are just weaned from milk? Those who are just drawn from the breasts? Well, precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So what is God saying? You can build your faith by staying into the word. You know, if, if the Apostle Paul says, don't be children here, does he say that anywhere else? And so as we study the scripture, we look at the Bible, and that's a theme that runs all the way, all the way through scripture. God wants us to mature. He wants us to grow. Okay, then in Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13th chapter, and I know sometimes it's hard to, to keep up with turning to different books and trying, trying to concentrate. That's why I hand out the notes so that you can take those home and look, at, look it up yourself and read the same scriptures we're reading here. Hebrews 13, verses 7 through 9. The Bible says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith you should follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So don't be carried about with various and strange doctrines. I heard one today, somebody sent me a TikTok, and this woman was talking about our DNA, 
and uh, the atoms and, and all the things that are inside of us, and she likened them unto plants. And she turned Genesis into a teaching that made us sound like we're plants. And I thought, no, no, the Bible says that he, he gave us a soul. We're not plants, you know. And, but, but, but man, did, she was excited and people were clapping and yes, yes, you know. And I thought, this isn't even Bible doctrine. This is just somebody's idea that they pulled out of their head. And, and what did it do? It took away God's creativity in Genesis chapter 1. That's what it did. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it, 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 it molded all down to really that, uh, that we're, all, we're all exactly the same and we're all these plants and our plants keep growing and the leaves keep flourishing. And No. No, not at all. We're human beings. God created us. We have a soul. We have a spirit. We have a body. We're a trichotomy. So um, God says, don't, don't be carried about by these doctrines, uh, various strange doctrines. It's good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. In other words, if you're not getting built up, if, if what you're learning or what you're listening to isn't building you up, listen to something that builds you up. That's why I quit watching the news a long time ago. Look, I hear everything that's going on in the world just from people I hang out with. You know, they, they tell me everything that's going on. In fact, Nancy, tonight I told you about that young man who was murdered in Las Vegas by 15 young teenagers, beat him to death. She had no idea what happened. I heard that from somebody else. So I thought, well, I better see if that's true. And I just hit Google and said, young man killed in Las Vegas, and boom, 15 stories popped up. So there's a lot of things we can learn, but they don't build us up. They tear us down. They distract us. They, they get us filled with hate and anger and all these other things that, are, that the enemy wants us to be filled with. Okay, we're going to bring this to a close here. Romans chapter 16. And then I'm going to just briefly go over each thing uh, in Ephesians 4. Romans 16, 16 through 18. Well, here's something that the enemy tried to take away. Greet one another with a holy kiss or a holy hug. And the churches of Christ greet you. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the teaching that you have learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, but they serve their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. I can't tell you, uh, well, I can say this. I have a relative who's a Jehovah's Witness. And some of their biggest converts are from Christian churches. It's amazing. And he says, we've, we've got them from this denomination, that denomination, this denomination. And I think it's because they haven't, they haven't either truly been born again or they haven't sat under teaching of Scripture. And so they're easily deceived. So the Bible tells us this in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved. I have a, a, a friend who boasts that he's read the Bible over 60 times. Honestly, not exaggerating. I have studied through Scripture twice. I have not read the Bible, if you want to call it reading, more than twice. What I have done is studied each individual thing and asked God questions. What does that mean? Sometimes I only get through three verses. And I'll just say, Lord, you, show me what that means in other places so that I can connect all the dots here. And God never says, read the Bible. God says, study the scripture that you may be approved, uh, a man of God approved, not having to be ashamed. And I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that say, you know, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses came to my door and they just trashed me. You know, they asked me all these questions. I couldn't even tell them where the gospel was. 
And I tell them that's, that's why God tells us to study so that when he sends people to us and knock on our door, we can give an answer to every man that asks the reason of the hope that's within us. And, 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 and let me assure you of this, okay? Because I know the enemy will say, yeah, but that guy went to Bible school and he knows, no, baloney, I've never been in Bible school. I barely graduated high school. The only teaching I've had is from the Lord in the scripture. I don't have any formal teaching on anything. So if I can do it, y'all can do it. Amen? Amen. Uh, it's just something that we have to make a decision. I want to know more about my Savior. And, and truly, the reason I want to know more is so that I don't, I'm all puffed up and I know everything. I don't know much at all. But I know this much. People are going into eternity without Christ. And if I'm unable to give them an answer to the questions that they ask me, they may speedily go on their way to, to eternity without God. So I want to be able to answer their questions. And, and I can't answer everyone's question, but if I can't, I go to people who, who know and get the answer so I can go back to them and tell them. Because the fact of it is, once a person dies, after this is the judgment. There is no other thing. It is appointed in a man once to die, after this the judgment. So we're going to close with Ephesians 4.15. God wants us to speak the truth in love and grow up into him who is the head, which is Christ. And I know we have a lot of mature believers in this body, and I thank God for that. Uh, a lot of mature people have been walking with Jesus for 30, 40, 50 years. I thank the Lord for that. But we also have people here who have just barely come to Christ. So I'm, I'm trying to do what a workers' comp judge told me to do one time. Uh, my first boss uh, wrote beautiful reports, but I had to look up the words to see what they meant. And so when I got into court one day, the judge asked me, can I talk to you after, after this, uh, this trial? And I said, sure. And he said, can you do me a favor? Sure, judge. What, what would you like? I want you to write your reports from now on on a third grade level. That way, everybody in the courtroom can understand what you're talking about. And the attorneys can't twist the words. And that's so true. I mean, if you look at how Jesus taught, what did he talk about? Dirt, birds, seeds, water, plants, you know, rocks, fish. Jesus taught on a very a simple level so that even children could understand what he was saying. So God wants us to speak the truth in love. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 16 Zechariah 8 and verse 16 says, I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations which they had not known. And the land became desolate after them so that no one passed through or returned for they made the pleasant land. I'm sorry. Let me go to verse 16. Well, that's a good scripture too and that's about what's happening to the United States if we don't get it right. It's This beautiful land is becoming desolate. Verse 16. These are things that you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for the truth, justice, and peace. You know what we're lacking right now in our country? The truth. There's so many lies being told every day and falsehoods, you don't know what to believe anymore. So believe the Bible. Just believe the Bible. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. See, love is, love is action. Let's not just love in word. Let's love in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him. So the scripture is telling us, don't be hearers of the word only, 
be doers. And, and I praise God for many of you that are sitting here. If not all, you're doers. I've, I've heard, I've watched, I've seen, and I thank God that there's a lot of good works happening in this assembly. And I want to close with Colossians chapter 1. So we were in 1 John, if you just turn to your left, past Hebrews, you'll be in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. I want to start with verse 11, actually verse 10. And I shared on this last week. God writes all this stuff to us because he wants us to walk worthy of the Lord. Verse 10 says, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He wants us to be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. And he wants us to give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He's delivered us from the power of darkness. Now there's some Christians that say, uh, my life's falling apart. I just think demons are attacking me all the time. God says, he's delivered us from the power of darkness. Are we using the authority and the power that God has given us to fight the enemy? Amen? When he comes to you and says, well, I'm not even sure you're saved, you can say, well, according to 1 John chapter 5, verses 11, 13, Jesus said, he who believes that Jesus is the Christ is saved. He is saved. He has eternal life. And you go on through those scriptures, and it's God's promise that tells us we know him as Savior if we are trusting in his Son. He has conveyed us into the kingdom of his Son, the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption. We've been bought back through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins because he is the image, Jesus is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, that are visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Is that true? Did Jesus create all things? Yeah. First, uh, John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. So that is true. He is before all things, and by him all things consist, or by him all things are held together. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he will have the preeminence. I have... Um, I just want to just read the five points here that we studied tonight. God gave gifts to the church. We all have a gift. Ask the Lord if you don't know, what is my gift? God gave church ministers to help us be mature so that we, the church, us, so that we can do the work of the ministry. I, I have to laugh sometimes. I, you know, so I try to keep in touch with everybody, but there's some people that just wander off, and it'll come to my mind, oh, yeah, I haven't seen them for a couple weeks. I wonder what's going on. And then I'll call somebody and say, how are you doing? Well, it's about time you called me. And I am so tempted to say, how many times have you called me? You don't think I'm a human being and I have any issues and maybe I need prayer, maybe I need to be encouraged? Or am I just your psychiatrist whenever you need one? You know, I don't say those things. But it makes me think, how come, it's like my relatives in Utah. You know, I have to call them. They never call me, ever. In 51 years that I've been in Santa Maria. They don't call. I have to call. And then when I do call, sometimes they'll put a guilt trip on me. Well, it's been a couple months since you called. And one of them I rebuked and said, when is the last time you called me or sent me a Christmas card? When is the last time? Well, that's not our job. You left here, so it's your, your responsibility to stay connected with us. It's like, that's why I'm gone. That's why I'm in California. 
unbelievable how people are. And, and my, here's my point. It's up to us, church. One man cannot do it. And so God has given gifts to the church to help us mature and grow up so that we can say, wow, you know, I know people in here that I don't want to point you out, but they've told me, God spoke to my heart and told me to call this, this, uh, this brother. And I did. And man, we were on the phone for half an hour. And oh, it was so good. And, and man, I, a bunch of questions were answered that he had. And I said, you know, I pray we'll all get to that place where when we hear something in our heart, we don't just push it off. We actually go, we, we do it. Amen? True story. Last week, I woke up and was doing my chores around the house. And the Lord said to me very specifically, I want you to reach out to this person, that person, and this person, because tomorrow their dad's going to die. And, and I've known he's been sick. And so I did. And thank God I was obedient. I reached out to this one, that one, and this one. And just said, you know, I just want you to know I'm praying for you this morning. God put you guys on my heart. And I want you to know that I, I love you. I'll always love you guys. I'll be here for you. And I just wanted you to know that I'm praying for you and I'm praying for your dad. And they all three wrote back and said, thank you so much. We really appreciate the encouragement. The next day, I got a call from a friend of mine who lives here in Santa Maria and told me he had passed away. So then... I wrote another communication to all three of them, giving them some scriptures, some encouraging scriptures, etc., letting them know this is what God has to say about those who believe in Christ. When they leave their body, here's what happens. And they were very encouraged by that. So I don't always obey that little voice that says to do that, but I want to encourage myself and you when you hear that little thing in your heart that says, call this person or reach out to that person, the devil isn't going to tell you to do that. So you can pretty much know that's the Lord. Yeah, if you hear something like, go dig up their lawn and set their garage on fire, that's definitely the devil. <laughs> that's definitely the devil. But if you hear something like, call this guy up and encourage him or pray for him, that's the Lord every single time. Amen? Uh, third thing we looked at is, as a church, we're to come together in the unity of the faith. And I think that's what's really weakened the body of Christ in the United States is people aren't attending anymore. It used to be 39%, now it's less than 10 And I talk, I have a lot of friends that are ministers, and they're, they're, they're telling me, big churches, little churches, yeah, we're down. We're down. So... Again, church, we need each other. We, and you know, God supplies all of our needs. But sometimes he uses people with skin on them. Amen? Yeah. Verse 14, the apostle said, Don't be like children. Don't be like children who are tossed to and fro with every kind of teaching. Stick to the scripture. If you find a good minister on, on YouTube or TV and you like to listen to him, test them. Make sure what they're saying is biblical. And that's okay to listen to other teachers because why? God gave the church teachers, pastors, apostles. Okay, you know, so there's more out there. But I'm just saying, sometimes we'll start listening to somebody and get drawn away. I did in 2020. I started listening to all those prophets that were saying in June this will happen, in July this will happen, and they were all saying the same thing. And I thought, well, if they're prophets, it'll happen. And then when it didn't happen, then it was like, oh, Maybe God's telling me not to listen to them. So we have to be really careful. Finally, God wants us to speak the truth in love. And I found the easiest way when people come and say, you know, what do I do about this? I tell them, you know, I, I don't have a lot of wisdom. I have a lot of experience and a lot of stupid things that I've done in my life. But I'll tell you what God says about that. This is what God has to say. And sometimes they'll accept it and say, praise the Lord. And other times they'll just get mad and walk away. And that's, that's not our, our problem. Because they don't have a problem with you. They have a problem with the word of God. And so it's not, it's not personal. 
It's just God wants us to speak the truth in love. Amen? We are out of time. So if you'll stand with me, we're going to go ahead and close. And uh, I appreciate your patience here tonight. I've tried to present this the way the Lord had it outlined for me. What I take away from it is keep studying, keep encouraging, keep growing, keep maturing. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for this body of believers. Lord, there, it blesses me to see this many people on a Wednesday night. I thank you so much for this church body. And Lord, I know that a lot of things I said too may not even apply uh, to some, but it applies uh, to those who have an ear that God is speaking to us. So Lord, uh, even on YouTube, there's people that may not have ever heard something like that. So I ask in Jesus' name that we just meditate on those things, that you bless those who are listening later on YouTube, and that you continue to draw us close to you. And I thank you again, Father, for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray you will bless them and watch over them and keep them safe, Lord. And help us, Lord, not to wander or stray. And I thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' name. All of God's people said? Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Amen. Oh, yes, I do have to make one quick announcement. There'll be no ladies' Bible study tomorrow. Uh, the Bible study teacher uh, was out in the wind today and something flew into the eye that she just got operated on. So if you could please pray for Pamela. Uh, just that God would heal that and uh, no study tomorrow. Okay, amen. God bless you. Uh, Dave, I know you wanted prayer. If you'd like to come up, we'll, we'll be happy to pray for you. Paul, you're welcome to join us as well. Amen. Peace was laid on you by